Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action. This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the God's Authority presentation, Jesus analyzes the subject of love and authority, what God's authority is, what God has authority over, and what humans have authority over, the results of accepting or rejecting God's authority, and answers audience questions on the subject. Recorded on the 25th of November, 2016, in Newseville, Queensland, Australia. Thank you. Thanks for coming back on time. All right. Well, now we get to this uh, interesting conversation at the end of our fifth day, which is about God's authority. Most of you probably would have read the outlines and you've gone principle this, principle that, principle. God's authority. What's that there for? <laughs> and, uh, and yet it's probably one of the most important things we'd like to talk to you about in a lot of ways. So the topic is God's authority. And we'll be having a 40-minute discussion and a 30-minute Q&A about it. So, so let's get started. What do we mean by God's authority? Well, obviously, when you examine the way it is on earth and we've examined our hangover and so forth, we can see that we've got quite a few issues with authority, don't we? Like, we've got, like, it started with parental authority, where we've got some big issues there, where we really don't feel that parents should have authority over us, or we have the opposite belief, where we feel that, yeah, parents should have authority over us till we're dead, or till they're dead is often the case. So we have quite big distortions about this idea of authority. And then when it comes to human authority, like the human law enforcers and the human you know, lawmakers, most of us have quite a lot of disrespect for authority, probably. Isn't that the case? And so we end up in this state where we basically have this attitude towards authority that I'm the authority, and all you can go to hell. <laughs> and the problem with that is you've got seven billion people all having that attitude. <laughs> it's surprising that we even get anything done, isn't it? It just so happens that because of our injuries and so forth, a lot of us have the same, we have agreement about what constitutes the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. And so we have a certain level of cohesion in society as a result of the combined level of agreement. Of course, when nobody agrees with you, then on Earth you have very little authority, generally. Isn't that the case? Okay. So unfortunately that means that on Earth, God's authority is not recognised because hardly anybody on Earth agrees with it. All right? But of course, God's laws impose authority. So this is where a lot of our pain and suffering comes from. God's laws are imposing God's authority. We disagree with God's authority. And so naturally, we're going to set ourselves up as the authority. And the problem with that is we end up breaking the majority of the laws that tell us that God has authority. So this human law hangover, the manner in which th those in authority have treated us as children, has had a major influence in our life. Right? A huge influence in our life, actually. And it affects how we see authority and it affects how we see God's authority in particular. So let's look at a definition of authority. What do we mean by authority? Well, it's the label we're giving to the sum total of God's principles of scope, hierarchy, governance, responsibility and compensation. The foundation principle, scope, that forms the foundation for the other order-based principles, hierarchy, governance, responsibility and compensation, work all together in unison to create authority through law. That's what they do. So they assign authority not only 
over the soul, but also to the soul, allowing its ability to have authority over other things, independent of God. Which is interesting in itself, isn't it? So each soul becomes the highest authority over its creations as long as its cre creations, the constituent elements of its creation, have been created by that soul. Now, we'll see what that means as we go through the discussion. All right? So that's our definition of authority. Let's look at how that plays out with regard to love. So God's definition of love is, includes each soul governing and having power over its own creation. So basically God's saying, look, love means that you govern and have power over whatever you create. So God, is because he loves you, is giving you governance over the things you create. He wants that to happen. He sees that as an act of love. He doesn't see you creating and somebody else having governance over it. He only sees you creating and having governance over what you create. Now, of course, governance can be assigned to others, but from God's perspective, it still is a lot about what you created. So, so an example of that is like some people create something like um, a forum on Facebook, for example. Right? Just a Facebook forum, Divine Truth Facebook forum. Managing such a beast is very difficult. And so what happens is most people who create it, they get it and it's going like nobody's business, but it's all sorts of stuff, heaps of fun, loving things going on. And before, So what do they do with it? They say, they look around, oh, that person might take over that, that person might fix that, that person might. So I'll get all those people to help me. What's that now doing? They're now not taking responsibility for their creation. They're wanting other people to do it. And then they go, oh, it's getting too heavy for me, but it's not heavy for her that, you know, she's, she's in that, she, Kate's handling it, okay. I'll give it all to Kate. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> you can have the lot. <laughs> right? Now, from God's perspective, that's a major sin against the issue of responsibility. Assigning complete authority of one of your creations to another person is a major problem. And most people do it when most people, you could say, bail out of responsibility when the sense of responsibility gets too great for them to personally handle. And so they then try to assign responsibility to another. That, of course, is against this principle. So being the highest point of hierarchy over its own creation, the soul obviously should be the person that controls that creation. Right? We'll talk about some of the creations that meet these conditions. Having the final, so the soul, God's definition of love is the soul having final responsibility for its own creation. So, so from God's perspective, let's say you created this Facebook thing, it became a monster, you decided you're going to hand the monster to somebody else who's willing to take it over, they take it over and it becomes more of a monster. Who's, who is, who's to blame for that from God's perspective? You, the creator even though you've got nothing to do with it anymore. Because you never corrected your creation. You never brought it into harmony with love. So you're still responsible from God's perspective. And being compensated for the results of his own creation. So let's say somebody took it over and they really turned it into this terrible thing where, you know, it was all their own ideas get put into it now. And then, and then a lot of people think that's what divine truth is. And they go on practice their life like that. And there's hundreds or thousands of people who read it and they all find out. Who do you think is the one getting the compensatory, negative compensatory effect? The creator. Whoa. That's interesting, isn't it? something to consider. But that's to God's definition of love, just like we saw the definition of authority. So now that we understand what authority is and what love is, to a degree, let's look at how it all plays out in terms of God's authority. What does God have authority over? Well, you see, God's our blank canvas, our, not our blank canvas, obviously, but 
Our blank canvas here represents the infinite being. So remember God's infinite. So obviously God has immutable authority over all of God's principles, all of God's laws and all of God's creations. And the potential laws and creations formed through God's governing principles. So all future creations that are formed because of God's creations, whether that authority is recognised by the creation or not. So that's what God has authority over. It's pretty clear, isn't it? He has that authority. He's the infinite being. They all exist inside of him anyway. So naturally, he has authority over those things. Interestingly, though, he doesn't have authority over some things. He refuses to take responsibility for some things. So God has authority over human creations that contain elements that God created. So how does this sort of play out, do you think? So... So here's our human soul. Destroy it. Here's our soul. Um, let's look at the creations in three major categories. Physical. And we'll call it the metaphysical. And the soul-based creations. Shall we not? So we, you're right with dividing it into those categories. Yep, my pen there is purple, is gone, so it's time for us to throw purple away, get another. Okay, so here we go, there's our primary categories of that we want to look at creations. Now, come up with some creations for me. Yell them out. Physical creations. Building. House. What else? Garden. Car. Garden. Business. Children, 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 <laughs> children, <laughs> children, don't think so, why? God's creation, what have we done? You say you created a spiritual and physical body, did you? No, of course you didn't. <laughs> you created the damage. We examine, examine it from, uh, from a ch the children perspective. If we go, okay, what part of the child did we create? Well, the man, he created a sperm that shot itself into the... Is it fallopian tubes, is it? Travels up into the womb, mixes with the egg, of course, before it does so. And, and so he provided the sperm and she provided the egg. But, but, did they create the egg? And did they create the sperm? No, they didn't. Who did that? God did that too. <laughs> so what did you do? <laughs> you just made it shoot together, didn't you? That's all you did. That's it. So how can you say that's your creation? Don't you see that's you taking credit for a whole lot of other things? <laughs> can you see that? Yeah, man, that children, the children, where, where should that be? Nowhere there, <laughs> isn't it? It's nowhere there. Because God, uh, with children, God has authority over human creation to contain elements that God created. God created all the elements. <laughs> so who, who has authority over the child? God. God, not you. See, the whole concept, my child, completely flawed. Yep. Completely flawed. And the fact that as soon as, soon as you favour your children over other children shows how flawed. Right. Okay, what else did you create? Yeah, in, right, so motors, if you like. Sorry, a farm but not the animals. I don't know how much of that. Let me see. You put up a fence. Now, God created all the elements of that. <laughs> God created all the grass that they eat. God created the animals themselves. God created the water. God created all the animal things that went into building the house. So you say the house is your creation? I don't know about that because at the end of the day, like they're usually made of materials and, and who has authority over all them? God. Because all the materials are going to have natural decomposition processes occur, of course, particularly if they're dead, right? 
the dead, or what, according to the life principle, what's going to happen? Dead materials going to get chewed up, chemically processed, so that they can create life somewhere down the track. So how much of these really are our creations? Not a lot of them, no, not, not none, because the idea or concept to build a house out of dead material came from us. <laughs> Didn't it? And the idea or concept to come up with a car that kills like 50,000 or hundreds of thousands of people every year, that came up from us. It's a good device too in a lot of ways. It allows us to get tra transport. So there's some good parts to it and some bad parts to it, right? Garden, who came up with that? <laughs> now they don't know what to say. <laughs> you came up with the design, did you not? But all the rest God did. Yep. So you came up with the design. Obviously, if you designed it out of harmony with some of God's principles, then naturally God's <laughs> trying to correct that design. Right? Business. Who came out of that? You came out with that? Maybe. Well, some of you think so, but the reality is you had spirits inspiring you and you had other people inspiring you and all sorts of things. So how many of your own ideas are actually your own ideas? Who knows, really, right? <laughs> Motor and so forth. You can see that even a lot of things we're taking credit for, really a lot of it is God's creation. And in God's laws are going to be the thing that dictates mostly what happens to that creation. Does that make sense? Therefore, God has authority over the parts that he created, and you only have authority over the part you created. Like, for example, with a motor, you have authority over the design. But you don't have authority over much else. It's all, been, all the other materials have been created by God, right? So, so you don't have much authority other than the design. Right? Here's, here's one. Painting, art, music, religion, <laughs> program. Right, we can see you know, there's millions of them, isn't there? We could go on for years and still... Okay. We can see things like music. Did you create music? No, you designed a series of things. You know who created music? Was it God put inside of your, inside of your system the mathematical formulas that dictate what you think is nice and what you think isn't nice when it comes to sound? And when they join together in a certain harmonious way, they sound good, and if they don't, they don't sound too good. But so you designed it, designed the flow of the music, but God actually created the mechanisms, the fact that the ear exists and the brain can process mathematically these sounds have all been designed by God. So God has control over all that. It's just what you come up with as the, des the design that is yours, right? But the design can certainly have an impact on people, even physically, can it not? If you design something physically, you engage something physically, like, for instance, a religion, you think how much impact that has on people. Huge amount of impact, right? So if that impact happens to be out of harmony with love, that's a, that's a huge physical creation that's out of, out of harmony with love. Right? Yeah. Okay, on the metaphysical, what are you creating? Well, you read it, you add a whole heap of things that are, are not metaphysical, but house, vehicles, uh, business, music, art, religions. I don't know. No, no. They're just, can you see? They're pretty much the same, aren't they? Uh, just re refined a bit differently, but uh, still the physical use of matter in the spiritual realm to create something that you want to live in. But how did you create the house? Oh, that's interesting. You created it through your condition somehow. So now we get into what the soul creates. What does the soul create? What was it? Desires? So yes, it certainly does, yes. Can, well, desires are faith, yes. Error. Error, so sin, we call it sin, shall we? 
Ja. Love? Does a soul create love? Didn't God create love and you just use it? Emotions? Did the soul create emotions? Doesn't it just use them? Okay, so it doesn't create... Addictions obviously involved in sin, don't they? Disease, but that's a physical creation. Disease. Facade. Fear is still sin, yeah. But there's not too many positive things you're thinking of here. <laughs> it's like, well, yes, that's desires. Longing is desires. Passion is desire, really, isn't it? Intentions. Well, can you see the soul should be able to create things physically too, can't it? Of course it could, couldn't it? It, it can create spheres. It can create universes. Can it not? The soul, the highest creation, is higher than the physical universe, so the soul, theoretically, should be able to create physical universes, which it actually does. Right? So, okay. Interestingly, we can see God's laws are trying to destroy anything that's out of harmony automatically. So God has authority over a lot of things, doesn't he? When you say a lot of things, it's like <laughs> pretty much most things with the exception of a few things that we can see that we're creating. But even universes and spheres, can we say that they are our creations? No, God created the potential in the laws for them to exist and our desire through being acted out finishes up creating those creations. So can you see that things like children, which people put in this first list, really God created their soul and the laws governing the bodies, so we can't really say... We created them, can we? No? And so who has authority over them? Not us. Right? Elements of, by, of creation by humans that needed elements God created in order to exist or survive. So pretty much everything, <laughs> everything isn't, falls into that category except for a few things here, right? Hmm. Fall into that category. All right. Can you see straight away too, many of you are so worried about you know, fixing things here. Like, but these things, God's laws are already attempting to fix. But there's some things in this column you're not worried about fixing at all, and yet God's laws are not going to fix them either. Interestingly, because they are directly your creations. God's laws, of course, are attempting to bring them into harmony with God's universe. But your will is involved here. Your desire is involved here. God will not fix them for you. You have to fix them. They're your creations. You follow? So can we see we're starting to see how, what God has authority over, which is quite a lot, obviously. But also we're starting to see that there are specific things that you've been ignoring authority over. And there's other things you've wanted to take authority for. You want to you be the person who did that. And yet, like children, for example. Oh, I'm so proud of my children. Which part of them are your children? The very first genetic structure that wasn't even yours. It was just half yours. Isn't that true? It's not all yours. It's just half yours. Now, God does not have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements that God created. But God does have authority over the principles and laws that govern the effects of those creations. So, here's an example. God does not have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements that God created. God did not create sin. So God will not take authority over sin. He will not. That's you created that. We created that on earth. We created that. Humans created that. He does have authority over the principles and laws that try to dis dis dissolve sin, that try to redeem us from sin. He has authority over that. But those principles and laws are actuated either by will or desire, which is a human thing as well. So we've, we've got to engage the process before it will happen. 
So most of you are worried about things that you don't need to worry about and then you're not worrying about the things you do need to worry about because of this authority issue. There are certain things that you have authority over that God cannot fix while you exercise the authority you have in the manner that you're exercising it. So let's look at human authority more, the scope of human authority. Now this is a merging of what you've learnt so far. God does not have direct authority over human creations that do not contain elements that God created. So he doesn't have authority over some of these things because he didn't create them. He didn't even he, he created the possibilities of them existing through creating emotions and creating the ability for have energy flowing and so forth. But he didn't create the actual emotions themselves. You did that. Like the emotion of anger. God didn't create it. He doesn't even have it. The fact that you have you've got the ability to create any emotion you want and if anger happens to be one of those emotions then you create it but you created it he didn't so who's going to get rid of it you go please God help me get rid of this anger well he'll help you but if you say please God get rid of this anger for me is that going to ever happen no it's not does that make sense because we're not taking authority over our own creations. God does have authority over the principles and laws that govern the effects of the creations. So he wants to help you destroy anger. He wants to help you destroy sin. But your desire has to be engaged to do it. And he can't control your desire. He's given you the gift. You control it. Therefore, you control what happens with it. So humans have direct authority over the creations that do not contain elements God created. Sin is an example. It does not contain elements that God created. God created laws that govern its operation, but he didn't, contain the, he didn't create the constituent elements. You did. It's a feeling that come from within you, that you created. You follow? So therefore God is not going to do anything about it. He created mechanisms to measure it. So he knows that anger has this formula and sadness has this formula and all those things. He contained mechanisms to measure it because being the all-wise, powerful being he is, he knew that at some point you'd come up with emotions that he didn't, that he didn't create. Does that make sense? Because he gave you the gift of being able to create them, being, being the exercise of your desire. Joanne, you'd like to ask? So in the creation of the spheres, I'm having a little bit more difficulty. Like when you said that you were the first one to create the eighth sphere, the 36th sphere, how... I didn't create it though, did I? What, I, what happened? God, God created laws that created the potentiality of the spheres existing. Right. Then as soon as the first person received enough of God's love, which also comes from God... Okay the law that governed the existence of the need, the need for that sphere to exist now got triggered All and right. the sphere came into existence. Does that make sense? So our soul doesn't create the spheres? Well, it does by increasing its development. But how does it do it? By receiving some of God's love to create it. But I'm talking about the spheres below the six. Ah. See, they were created directly without any interference from God. Were they not? Yes. God didn't inject God's love into them. In fact, what happened is people removed love from themselves and in the process of removing love from themselves and continuing to sin, their condition worsened and that, that meant that we needed a place to live. And so our, our condition worsening created that place to live. God created the potentiality of that sphere being created, but we created every sphere below the six. Wow, because and in the first sphere, there's like thousands of different sort of uh, levels in uh, you could call them levels or different conditions in the first sphere, and every one of those worsening levels was created by somebody. The very first person to enter that condition needed that place to live, so the sphere was created. But God didn't do that. So who's going to destroy hells? We are. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much. God's not going to destroy them. God's laws are working to destroy them, but God's not going to destroy them. We have to. Same as sin. God's not going to destroy it. We have to. We created it. We need to destroy it. Does that make sense? God can help us. We can ask for God's help, and if we're sincere, God will help. But, but he's not going to do it for us. Does that make sense? Pierre? Yeah. Now, I'm only halfway through my presentation, so <laughs> and I've only got 10 minutes God, to go. God so. did create also the potential for anger, for instance. Like, if we did, he didn't create this potential, we could not be Oh well, yeah, he created, he created the potential for any emotion. But th it's like me saying, like, yeah, I give you a knife, and you go and murder someone, so are you now going to blame me for giving you a knife? Isn't, isn't a knife useful for other things? So aren't emotions useful for other things? You can have happiness and you can have, you know. And anger can be a positive emotion then also? I don't know if it can, really. But, but certainly happiness is a positive emotion, love is a positive emotion, and joy is a positive emotion, and, you know, enthusiasm and desire is positive, and, you know, all these other emotions are positive. So I create all those, and I go, that's mine. And then when anger comes along, I go, that's not mine, you did that. <laughs> I just imagine if he did not create anger, what would happen, you know? He, the potential for anger, what but would happen? He, he needed to create the potential for anger, because he gave you free will. If, if, Giving a free the gift of free will meant that God had to allow the potential of most things to occur. So he had to allow for the potential of any emotion. Because if he didn't allow it, he just if he if he said, Oh, I'm giving you the gift of free will, but but I'm not gonna allow you to have anger and this and that and this and that and this and that. Have you got free will anymore? No. Of course you no. haven't. So in giving you free will, he had to give you the gift of being able to create these creations that are not in harmony with his universe, didn't he? Isn't that a part of the gift? Of course it is. Yeah. You know, this is where we're not too logical sometimes, right? Okay, so let's look at examples of, of human authority. We've seen this example of sin. We've seen a child sin. Interesting. A child sinning. Who created, the, who created that? Isn't it the parent's condition that creates that? So isn't the child sinning attributable to the parent, the parent has to destroy it, right? Disease in the body, another example. You can see that. God didn't create disease in the body, he created a perfect system, works perfectly. He, he created the perfect human couple and the, uh, the whole body was great. It all worked real well, no diseases, no sickness, no accidents, nothing. <laughs> Everything was great until we decided to go and create some of those things. Because we wanted to be, we wanted to override God's authority. And then, of course, we created those things. Does that make sense? Catherine, you'd like to ask? Isn't uh, disease the result of sin? Of course. Yeah. So God created the laws that give us the feedback mechanism that creates sin. But he didn't create sin itself, oh, sorry, disease itself. He created the ability for you to sin. But he had to do that because that's what free will is, the ability to do something out of harmony with what he wanted. So he had to give you free will and therefore had to give you the ability to sin. Can you see that? Otherwise, you wouldn't be, have free will anymore. You'd just be a robot saying, I'm going around having free will, but I can't sin. The, you, where's the free will in that? He needed to let you sin. If that's what you wanted to do. And then we cause other things because of it. <laughs> Sorry? And then we cause other things because, because of, of it. Because of it, like disease. But that's, you know, God just said, well, that's the result of sin. His laws create the potential for disease to exist, but again, did not create the disease itself. It was our desire to sin that create the, creates the disease. You see? Can you see the difference? Yeah. And God, like God's even trying to help us. He's trying to go, I want to help you get rid of this disease. <laughs> like he's, not, he's not unloving and going, oh, you got the disease now, you stupid idiot. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to help you do anything about it. He's not like that at all. He, he feels compassion for the fact that you sinned and you created the disease. He wants to help you solve it, but he wants to help you understand what its cause is. 
If he, if he just come along and said, oh, you've sinned and you've made that disease, I'll just wipe that disease from you. Go on, go on your way now. And then what would you potentially do? Just sin again? The same way, probably. And he goes, oh, then he's... What kind of a maintenance nightmare is he creating for himself if he did that? Can you see it? It'd be a maintenance nightmare against the economy principle, wouldn't it? Like, here I am going around, wiping around, wiping away everybody's sin. Imagine, eventually you got... 20 whatever billion at the moment sinning consistently still right 20 you know, 7 billion or so souls sinning imagine uh, what a job running around all day every day wiping out everybody's sin uh, it's not a very effective use of your time so so he's got to make you responsible for that and in fact free will makes you responsible my soul-based spiritual condition except for substances that exist in the soul that are from god received by choice so in other words, whatever my condition is right now is my responsibility, except where I've had some of God's love enter me. That part, God's love part, is God's, God has direct authority over that. Right. Now, of course, you can ignore it. You can. The reality is you can ignore the love that you've received. But isn't that an exercise of your desire to ignore it? Right? So any consequences that come as a result of you choosing to ignore the love you've received, isn't that another one of your sins, really? Which are your creations. So, human authority. We've got plenty more examples, of course, and we could keep going, couldn't we? Emotions out of harmony with God's principles, creations out of harmony with God's principles, and so forth. So we could go on for ages about that. But... God has no authority over the human use of will. Remember, that's also desire. But does have authority over its effects upon the soul and the environment because it has governance over the laws that govern the soul. So he does not have authority over the sin, but he does have authority over the laws that reflect the sin back to you and reflect the sin in the environment. And he created that potential specifically as an act of love for you so that you could measure the results of your sin and do something about it. If, if, if he didn't do that, you wouldn't know that you're sinning and you wouldn't know what to do about it. So he had to do that. Make sense? Okay. God expects humans, and this is a very key point, God expects humans to destroy their own creations that are out of harmony with God's principles. And God has created laws that assist the human in the destruction of such creations. Very important point. So, he's created laws that help you get rid of sin. But he is not going to do that for you. You have to engage the law with desire in order for it to happen. He expects you, in fact, as a part of your self-responsibility, to get rid of the creations that are out of harmony with love, out of harmony with God's principles. So how many of you are painters or artists or whatever? Many of you? Not many? A few of you? Yep, okay. So here we go. We have a painting. So let's say we're an artist and we create some art, just as an example. Now, God, from the moment that thought entered your head, to create the art, God's trying to destroy it. You know why? Because most of you use a physical material that's dead to create your art, don't you? Now, if it's using a material that's dead, can you see what are God's laws operating for all the dead things? The life principle says destroy all the dead things and turn them into food for something that's alive, doesn't it? So from the moment you had a conception to create your art, God's already trying to destroy it. Right? Okay? So then the question would come, well, how would I create art that's in harmony with the life principle? Well, my art's got to be made from th things that are alive. Now, that's possible, isn't it? But most of the time we don't make that possible. We create from things that are dead. So God's trying to destroy it. Now, so... so Let's say the art has a really like, terrible picture inciting people to racial violence. Right? 
while that art exists, inciting people to racial violence, and you see this in a lot of video games, right? The art that exists inciting people to violence. While that exists, God is trying to destroy it already, and God will eventually destroy it. Right? But while it exists, and its effects on other people are more emotional, aren't they? Those things he won't destroy. They're your creations. So the effect emotionally that it's had on other people that caused them to try and do things out of harmony with love, you are going to pay the penalty for that. You sort of go, whoa. Wow, that's pretty significant, isn't it? When you start thinking about the effects of your creations on others. Right? So the art itself, within a few hundred years, unless it's preserved in some amazing way, is going to get destroyed. But the effect of the art on the persons, which are a living memory of that art in their soul, how long is that going to take to be destroyed? That could take millennia to be destroyed. Right? Uh, if you think about it that way, you can start pondering, well... What am I doing with my art? Isn't it? What am I doing? Yeah, it's quite a significant thing, isn't it, that? Sandra, you'd like to ask? Uh, in the book, um, Life in the World Unseen, um, there he talks about, I think it's Robert, his name is, he talks about how uh, there are libraries with artwork and like Picasso, or, Pi or maybe not Picasso, but yep. some of the ancient artists have created these artworks how does that really is it still unloving to have those artworks there or well is how it is the art created if it's created with dead matter oh. then god's already destroying it so they must must create them with living matter in the um, some have and some haven't okay so the ones that have will last and the ones that haven't won't okay does that make sense yes it's quite Thank simple you. yeah okay so let's look at our choices and decisions now shall we just out of interest you can see our choices and decisions are quite critical when it comes to this authority issue. What does it mean to accept God's authority? Well, the person who emotionally accepts God's authority automatically loves, respects and accepts God's personality, attributes, character, principles, laws and creations and is more open to desiring God's love. So, so the beauty of accepting God's authority is that we are now open to receiving God's love. See, most of you are trying to receive God's love while at the same time denying God's authority. That's not possible, actually. You're not, you're, not going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to do that. You can't get into an one condition with God while you reject God's authority. And can you see it also is about accepting his personality, attributes and character, as well as his principles and laws. Even his creations. Like how often we don't accept even God's creations. You know, the humble mosquito. What do we do with him? <laughs> One of God's creations. He's created for a purpose. Everything God created for the purpose of our benefit. So the mosquito has a beneficial role to the human. That's why he created it. Right? Yeah. <coughs> what do we do with it? We try and destroy it. We don't understand, though, when we destroy it, we're upsetting the ecosystem, the balances of things, and therefore harming ourselves. We're also not accepting God's authority. Just simple ways like that. Yeah. Okay, what does it look like if we reject God's authority? Well, to be honest with you, it's not really possible, is it? You think of all the things that we've listed that we thought were our creations, and the majority of them end up being... God's creations that we've just put into a different design. Right? That's what they end up being. So God has most of the authority over them. And the only thing that God doesn't have authority over, he still has laws that try to destroy them. Right? But, but he doesn't take authority over them. So these are the things that God is not, not taking authority over. That's our authority. But to be honest, rejecting God's authority is just an imaginary place that we live in. It's like the imaginary place of thinking you're separate from your soulmate. You know? It's a place that we've manufactured through an emotional condition. Right. As a result of that, 
It is the choice to believe, feel and act as if God's authority does not exist. And frankly, many of you have done that, right? We know that you have. You either act as if your authority is higher than God's or that God's authority just doesn't exist on that thing. And if we're honest, if we look at the planet, the majority of people on the planet feel that God's authority doesn't exist, don't they? Really? It's a choice to reject God's personality. So this is where we start seeing the sin of rejecting God's authority. We're actually rejecting the very being who God I whom God is. God's very nature and character and attributes and all the, all the aspects of God we're already rejecting now because we're rejecting God's authority. So can we then accept, receive God's love in that place? How, it's like saying, can I... Can I love you while at the same time I'm rejecting your personality and nature? Of course I can't. I have to first accept your personality and nature, don't I? In order to love you. And I'm not talking about your injuries, which we talked about before, in the will-based side of things, but I do need to accept who you are and your personality and nature. So it results in not being able to establish a relationship with God or receive God's love. That's our problem. When we reject God's authority, we can't establish a relationship with the very person we're rejecting. Right. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's automatically going to create unhappiness, of course, because all the things I'm creating are going to usually be out of harmony with God's authority as well, which obviously means I'm sinning and therefore creating more unhappiness. So it's a pretty important issue, isn't it? Can you see that? Yeah. It's like, and can you start seeing, well, okay, um, my business ventures, what I design, it affects everything, doesn't it? What art I produce, what music I produce. Like, I've got to consider what parts of it and I have, I have authority over and also what parts of it you know, in the long run, I'm going to be accountable for. Right? And most of us don't consider that. And to be honest, rejecting God's authority is a part of my sin against the Holy Spirit. Remember, we sin against the Holy Spirit when we're not allowing God's love to enter our soul. If we reject God's authority, we're rejecting God's very personality and nature, therefore not allowing God's love to enter our soul. So it's a part of the biggest possible sin. It has the biggest possible effect on our life because we can't grow beyond our created condition. So we're limited in our growth if we keep doing it. And to be honest, that's why how the majority of six fear spirits are. They continue to reject God's authority. That's their primary sin. It's a big problem on the planet, rejecting God's authority. It's a big problem in the spirit world. There are literally billions and billions and billions of people who continue to reject God's authority, therefore consigning themselves to growth until the sixth, the sixth sphere and no further. It has the biggest negative effect on your future potential life. Right. So you can see it's a pretty big issue to resolve. And, and my suggestion is have a feel about all the ways in which you reject authority how you fight against it and you don't like being controlled and you don't like being told what to do i gave the example in the first group about a lady who came to visit us and who stayed in one of our tents oh it was to you sorry about that it was to so you've got that example she can you see she was rejecting my authority right Directing my authority. Could she have a relationship with us? No. Not while she's doing that. Can't have a relationship with a person that you're rejecting the authority of. And the tents, although it has a lot of what God created in them, at the end of the day were something that I desired to do, therefore should take authority over. Therefore control how they could be damaging to someone else. Right? And so that's something I needed to do. So our choice 
to receive God's love, I'm really going to have to learn how to accept God's authority. That's what I'm going to need to do. And it's such a big issue for us. It's a choice we all have to face. The first human couple decided to reject God's authority. Tens of thousands of years of pain and suffering have come about for many people as a result of that choice. That's an example of how a single couple rejecting God's authority can cause a huge amount of damage to the planet and to people. Yep. So we need to uh, think about that. And the trouble is, uh, once we do that, we're incapable of a soul-based understanding of anything. And basically, we're severely limiting ourselves as a being from then on. Fab, you'd like to ask? It could go the other way too, though, couldn't it? What's that? Like, instead of having the negative rejection of God's authority, you accept God's authority and could positively help everyone on the planet too. Yes, of course, if you go back to the acceptance of God's authority, emotionally accepting God's authority, we automatically love, respect and accept God's personality and nature. Imagine if you're going around the world in that state. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of advantages, not only for you, but also for people around you in that state. And in fact, to be frank, far more. Because remember, when you engage a, a condition of love in harmony with God's principles, all of God's laws are supporting your actions, not trying to destroy them anymore. So now you have the potential to create something that can last thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years potentially. Like, How long do you think the seventh sphere is going to last? That got created through my development. How long is it going to last? Potentially it could last millions of years. So that was a creation due to my desire, created it with the, in harmony with the laws, therefore the, poten the potential God created, but through my desire got created. That creation is probably going to survive for, who knows, potentially millions of years, right? Isn't that amazing? You can have some creations that last millions of years, and how long is the first sphere going to last? Not millions of years. It's impossible for it to last millions of years, actually. Because God's creations are trying, God's laws are trying to destroy it. Once the last person leaves it, that universe, it's a universe, separated by interstellar boundary, that universe will cease to exist. Once the, first, once the last person gets out of it. In the, in, it's a lovely statement in the Bible, it says that God, God is rolling up the heavens like a book scroll. What do you think that refers to? The lowest heavens from the first to the fifth are all just going to be slowly dissolved. Eventually there'll be no need for them. There'll be everybody will be out of them. Once the last person leaves them, that's the end of it. They don't need to exist anymore and they will not exist anymore. Of course, if someone in the future decides to create them, then they'll get created again. Yeah. So it's an interesting concept, isn't it, about God's authority and what creations are going to be destroyed and what creations we need to co consider of our own that we need to take action about. You don't have to worry. See, most of you ask me lots of questions about things like, oh, but I've made this, you know, this kind of device or whatever, and I realise now it's unloving. Well, I wouldn't be too concerned about that because it's going to get destroyed in the long run because <laughs> most of God's laws are all acting upon the physical to get destro destroy it. The real key part of it is it has it created sin in some way because that's the thing that you're going to have to be involved in destroying, you see? So can you see, we, we worry about things a lot here, like we worry about having done the wrong thing in the past physically, but we hardly concern ourselves at all about having done the wrong thing in the past of creations that actually God has no control over. Right? That it's our authority. We need to take complete control over them. Right? 
And that's why in the pageant messages it says that sin will be destroyed by humankind, not by God. God's laws are attempting to assist the destruction, but in the end it will be humans that destroy it. Because it's humans that created it. And God's not going to destroy something that we created. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do now is just a quick changeover. And we'll only have 10, well, probably 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Um, and I'll answer some of the questions in the books first and then get to some of your questions. So just give us a minute for myself and Lena to change over. So the, the subject is now God's authority, question and answers. So what we've got here is a list of questions. Kerry, can we start with your question? And then we'll go to Paige next to you. Not too sure whether you've answered this already. But I have. Yeah. But I'm asking you to ask the question. <laughs> so there must be a reason why. <laughs> Can you explain further? Each soul is the highest authority over its creations as long as all constituent elements of its creation have been created by that soul. Yes. So we have talked about this quite a lot in the presentation, have we not? Yeah. So you're starting to understand what that means? Yep. Yep. But you can see in our list that we drew here that there are certain things that we have authority over and certain things we don't. So in the case of all of these physical creations, God is the creator of most of the constituent elements. So he created the materials that, that we use, the, you know, all of the chemicals that we use and so forth, all of those that were created, the laws that govern those particular materials and, and chemicals are all being created by God. So God created the majority of these things, right? So that means if they're out of harmony with God's love, God's going to be also trying to destroy them because yep. God, God has control over his own elements. Does that make sense? Yep. So God's trying to destroy them. The key part is what part of it has been created by us? That's the question you need to ask yourself with all of your creations. What part of this creation is created by me and only me? What can I do about that? I can bring that into harmony with love or leave it out of harmony with love. If I leave it out of harmony with love, unfortunately it's going to have flow on effects, is it not? on other people and that's where they start creating soul-based problems that I need to take res some responsibility for and this is where we need to take particular care looking at the difference between who has the highest authority over what and which part of it we are the highest authority of and the part of it that we are the highest authority of is the effects that it has upon other people we have control over that. So this is where if you really gave that consideration and thought, you would not be purposefully creating something that could, in the end, right, influence a person down a road that's quite negative. So you see this happening quite frequently, right? Like something like Facebook is an example. Facebook encourages addictions, does it not? encourages you to feed addictions so the people who created Facebook are really encouraging the feeding of addictions in other people and how many Facebook users are there now whoa billions potentially right billions of Facebook users imagine that soul damage oh pretty intense right soul damage something that encourages addictions is a is a problem for the soul it's encouraging people to live in their stuff, right? The concept is, I'm just giving them what they want. And so this is where we've got to be very careful as humans about creating something that just gives other people what they seemingly want, right? Very dangerous. Can I just ask one more question? In no, I'd like to move okay. on to Paige's question if I can. Yep. With regards to God expects humans to destroy their own creations that are out of harmony with God's principles and has created laws that assist us to do that, could you give a physical, emotional and spiritual example that illustrates this, please? So can you see why I drew this table? We've got the physical, the metaphysical 
the spiritual is all about the soul, of course, the soul-based issues, re issues regarding love and emotions and so forth. You can see how it all works now, Paige. There's no mm -hmm. question about how it all works. Everyone's fine with that. So, so there's, a, there's some examples there. In the first presentation that we did for the first group, we also gave some other examples. And my suggestion is to look at that. And you will see how God expects, what creations God expects us to destroy. Now, you can see that God is already helping us destroy a lot of them. right? But there are certain things, music, art, religion, business, that you can see have very, very long-term effects on the soul. And so they take a lot longer for God's laws to have an effect on because each person has to engage their desire to destroy it. So how do, how do the religions on the planet get destroyed? In the end, it's going to require every single member of that religious faith deciding to destroy the bits of that religion that are out of harmony with the principles of love. That's how it's going to get destroyed or modified. No other way. It's not going to get destroyed by some people deciding, some Christians deciding, like they did in the Crusades, to go and war with the Muslims so that, so that they could destroy it that way. It's not going to get destroyed that way. In fact, all that's doing is creating more sin and therefore more things the humans have to destroy. You see? In the end, every single person of every religious faith on the planet that is out of harmony with God's laws and principles is going to have to personally choose to destroy what is now within them with regarding to those belief systems. That's how it's going to get destroyed. There's no other way to destroy it. That's the danger of creating a new religion. You can see why I'm not one not creating one there's a huge danger is it not creating a new religious faith that has all of these ideas and concepts that are out of harmony with love big danger for the future yep. can i ask can you ask another one related no. to this is it related yeah. you sure i'm sure kerry's was too why should i let you ask another one well, that kerry okay. not? you don't know and um, is there some kind of uh, equality that is i'm not aware of here Let's go to Pierre. Where are you, Pierre? Oh, hang a sec. Let's meet and go to... No, there's those two. Let's go to Pierre. Can we... Where are you? Here down the front. And the next person after Pierre, Phoebe. So you're just two back from Pierre. Uh, which Your one? first one. Right? Okay. How to get to love God's authority? Can you share um, your personal experience about it in the first century? And in this incarnation? Yeah, Pierre, I find it real interesting, the question, because to me I've never had this feeling of not loving God's authority, so I don't really know how to get to love God's authority. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, I don't know why that is, but for me it's been a... I suppose I've always had this feeling inside of myself that God, the Creator naturally should have authority over God's creations <laughs> and I've never tried to rebel against it um, so I'm not really sure how to answer your question about it because right my whole life even in this life I've had a, a deep respect for God's authority and and also uh, a, a love for it actually knowing that it's in harmony with my own interests actually you know it is in harmony with my own interests and also not only mine, but the interests of everybody on the planet. So I, I, I think perhaps for a person who doesn't love God's authority, the best thing to do is to go back to the inception of why, which is all to do with emotional injuries from childhood, obviously. Does that make sense? And also deep belief that maybe God didn't create. This whole concept of evolution, I suppose, promotes that, doesn't it? promotes a belief that things just come about by chance. You know, all these principles and laws come about by chance. All of the creation come about by chance, so therefore there's no one that has authority over them, is basically this presumption. And so I feel a lot of false beliefs on the planet promote a lack of respect for God's authority. But in terms of learning how to uh, gain a respect for God's authority, I feel a lot of that's to do with uh, removing the effects of our lack of desire for authority, which all happened in our childhood experience. Yeah. 
and the assimilation of religious and scientific belief systems that are out of harmony with, with love. Yeah. You wanted to say something about that? Oh, I was just going to add to that, to, to that, as someone who hasn't loved God's authority always, um, what Jesus suggests, finding the inception of the, the injury we have about authority, but also desiring opening our heart to, to the truth that God do, has to, God's authority is there for our benefit, the things that Jesus naturally has always noticed. A lot of us are resisting noticing and so courses like this I think help you open up to the understanding that wow these principles are there for my benefit and mm. yeah that mm. helps yeah yeah good question though thank you Phoebe thank you so are you saying that although God did not create for example my facade mm -hmm. and so does not have authority over it yep. Because my facade harms God's creations, which he does have authority over, he is attempting to destroy it. Yes, he's created laws and principles that are attempting to destroy it, but he doesn't have authority over it because you have to engage in a desire to destroy it in order for it to be destroyed. So your facade, like any other sin that you create at the soul level, has to, to get rid of it has to be, is governed by your desire. And if you do not engage the desire to get rid of it, it will not be gotten rid of. It will not. God's trying to get rid of it. Obviously, all of God's laws are trying to trigger it, trying to get rid of it, trying to demonstrate to you the pain of it. But while you hold on to it and don't exercise the desire to destroy it, it will be there for as long as you do that. That might be a thousand years, two thousand years, ten years, five years, two years. depends on how you exercise your desire. Can you see the power of your desire? It's yeah. Quite intense, yeah. isn't it? And, and the more desire we have, the more God will show us what it is. What it is, yeah. So when we first open up to the concept of facade, we don't realise how much of a facade we're in. But as we do, we develop a desire, our desire starts building, we see more and more and more and more and more and more. And many of you have already seen quite a lot, but still have no desire to destroy it. So when is it going to be enough? When are you going to see enough of it to destroy it? That's a good question, isn't it? When are you going to see enough of things to actually go ahead and destroy them rather than keep creating or, or ignoring them, which is what many of us want to do? Not taking personal responsibility is also an issue because we often go, oh, yes, I've got them, but then we do nothing about them. But p true self-responsibility says I've got a desire for self-awareness. That means I have a desire to do something about them. I've got a desire to live in harmony with love and truth. Therefore, I must have a desire to do something about what I see. So it's actually a sin, an additional sin, to see something and not do anything about it. And God actually, God, God's laws actually correct that with severe, more severe penalties than a person who doesn't see their sin yet. So if you see your sin and, and don't do anything about it, remember this is something I said to Alex before I removed him, something that, that he needs to do. He, he, he sees his sins more than many of the others who I removed from this group do, but he doesn't still have a strong desire to do anything about it. That, that, is, even, that is even a worse state to be in. Uh, you're going to end up in, in a lot of darkness if you keep doing that. And how does God show us that we, oh, I guess, we would be aware that we're doing that? But do, do the law of attraction <coughs> get worse? And Of course they will, yes. Okay. Yep. But even for most people who are in that state, they don't notice it because they're not sensitive. They're too, they're too engaged in the, what they call the pleasure of sinning to notice it until they pass. And, then they, and even after then, they don't stop for many years, often until the pain and suffering that they experience is so intense that they now are sensitive. It's so intense that they're now sensitive and start to see it. Uh, man, it's like, and that's how people get into a very, very destructive, self-destructive state. Yeah. Thank you. Very important to correct that. Um, okay, let's, uh, so we've done those. I'll just use my pen here. Uh, so David Raisman is next, and um, Wayne is after David. Where is Wayne? Yep, just in front of you, in front of David. Yep. 
Was it the first or second? Uh, second, sorry, Dave. Yep. Thanks. If God's authority is absolute, isn't our rebellion and opposition completely futile? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Completely futile, really. So uh, the sad part of it, though, is that it's futile, but we create a whole heap of pain. So isn't that stupid? Like, uh, uh, like this is what we do as humans. Frequently we engage in futile behaviour, not understanding that, it's, that not only is it just futile, but it creates additional pain and suffering. So that's a very sad thing that we don't recognise. And I feel that it's something that we need to see that rebellion is not only futile, but also a source of pain and suffering. Yeah. If you just pass the mic to Dan, to Wayne. So to accept God's authority, we first need to ask God to help us remove the emotional blockages to God's authority. Well, God can help us remove the emotional blockages to God's authority. But can you see if we have emotional blockages to God's authority, it's highly unlikely we're going to ask for that help. <laughs> can you see that from a logical perspective? So, so, so can you see that probably a lot of the removal of blockages to God's authority is going to have to be done alone because initially we've, our blockages pr preclude us from receiving help from God to do it. That's the irony of it. So, so I do feel that's something we need to consider. You can't sincerely ask God to help you remove something that you sincerely want to retain. Right? And we've got to first work through the desire to retain it, our current position of, of, of rejecting God's authority, before we really could even ask for help to remove it. So a better thing to do is ask for help for God to show us how we're rejecting it or those things that might happen. And that God's already attempting to do these things through the law as well, isn't he? So a key, a key here, th again, is to be sincerely examining you know, the self-responsibility. Go for self-awareness. Like This is where I see most of your work needs to occur, self-responsibility. Go for self-awareness. Stop avoiding self-awareness. Stop trying to avoid where you're at. Try to find out where you're at. Look at how the law of attraction is bringing you things of where you're at, things like that. That's the, that's the thing that needs to be done because while you have emotional blockages to God's authority, you are not going to ask for help to remove it. So that's sort of like a, sort of like a what they call it, a catch-22, isn't it, a way? Yeah. Okay, Joyce, where are you? We go across to Joyce and Nikki on this side. Thank you. Um, if each physical illness has the same cause in each person and disease was not created by God, did God create the potential for disease and then the collective human soul create the actual disease? Yes. Very simple answer, yes. So, so basically we're saying that diseases weren't caught, created by God. The potential had to be created by God because God gave you free will. Free will to create a disease if that's what you want to do. God had to give you that potential. He, in other words, he gave you the potential to shut down your emotional experience if that's what you so choose. He created a whole heap of laws to try and keep the emotional experience open, of course, but you have the potential to shut it down. Now, shutting down your emotional experience is the thing that causes disease. So he gave you the potential to shut down your emotional experience, which most of us on the planet engage quite readily, don't we? We just choose to do that. So that potential of shutting down you, you had to be given because otherwise you wouldn't be given free will. Mm. He's not forcing you to experience your emotion. He's saying to you, you need to choose to experience your emotion. Mm. Right? Mm. He created you from the time of your conception onwards to experience your emotion. A child naturally experiences their emotion far better than most adults do. So this is an indication that he created you to naturally be in that state. But your choice to shut down emotion is yours, not, not anyone else's. Now, because we collectively create it, 
it's not it's not just a collective creation every individual who shuts down an emotion in a certain area will create the disease even if that disease does not exist in the collective mm. in other words everybody on this planet could be disease free and Joyce decides to shut down this fe a feeling she has of needing men to give her acceptance and approval and to love her and projecting at them in order to do so and she so she creates cancer in her right breast but nobody else on the planet's got cancer you can do that but how was it decided that cancer would be like how did how did cancer itself as a disease mm -hmm. originally come about like i've just explained it joyce so you shutting down the emotional flow in a certain area creates the disease the relationship between the disease and the shutdown of the emotion in a certain area is is created by the laws that govern your very existence so god created the potential for you to create cancer but he didn't create it you did do you see yeah not convinced no. she's not convinced and i have to move on to <laughs> nikki uh, as God has created laws to assist us in the destruction of creations that are out of harmony with God's principles, does that mean when these principles are engaged, improvement can occur much more rapidly than degradation has occurred? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? So God gives us the ability to fix our problems faster than we had the ability to create them. <laughs> right? So that, that is the reality. In in actual occurrence though the majority of people are very slow to uptake all of the principles that allow for the destruction of these particular problems and as a result many of these problems remain for such a long time also there is the transmission of a problem from generation to generation emotionally that occurs and and so it's going to require all generations at a certain level to get rid of it before the next generation doesn't have it mm. Does that make sense? And, uh, and that, of course, is very dependent upon the will of each individual. Can you see the powerful negative effect we have by not engaging our will in a positive direction? We can be the one person that causes it for the next generation. One person. That's all, it create, all that's required to create problems for the next generation. One person. And this demonstrate has been created purposefully to demonstrate to us the in interconnectedness of all creation and in particular the interconnectedness of each soul and how each soul affects others mm. 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 which is actually a loving thing yeah. given scope and hierarchy and how things get created it's a loving thing for us to be mm. that to be demonstrated to us mm. Mm. yep cheers no worries now um karen henry um is the last person i'm going to be able to ask a question of i'm already a bit late so just your question number one, Karen. It's quite a long question, isn't it? Do you want to do all the exclamation marks and everything in it too for me? <laughs> I, I think okay. that's quite nice. <laughs> bit, of, bit of Karen's um, personality coming out there. <laughs> uh, so are you saying when I have emotions, thoughts, desires, beliefs, etc., in my soul that are out of harmony with love, that I've personally created the elements and subsequent combinations of these elements to form unloving beliefs, emotions, etc. Then my soul has created the disease in my bodies and unloving creations. Mm. No, but let's be a bit more specific. Yeah. It's not just you that has done that. Your parents obviously engaged in that process too <sighs> before you, you know, before you had a abil an ability inside of your desires and uh, uh, they actually affected your will before you knew how to have a desire uh, does I that see. make sense mm -hmm. see this is a this is the problem with parents not understanding truth is that they finish up affecting the child's will and therefore affecting the child's ability to understand the power of desire mm. and it's the desire that cures everything right mm. so so while it is true that any emotions, uh, beliefs, and so, etc., that you have that out of harmony of love create disease, that is true. Yeah. The issue is who created it, not just you. So, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm seeing that it's my creation instead of 
yeah, the true. So we've got to be honest about that. that. We've got to see that it's not just you. It's also whoever you were, your caregivers and society mm -hmm. at large In who general. existed at the time of your birth or, mm -hmm. or at the time of your conception till now have also yeah. affected this creation inside of you. So can you see, isn't it wonderful that God's laws attribute all of these things to the different mm, yeah. entities involved rather than saying, no, you're to blame for <laughs> everything now. Like, yeah. Imagine mm -hmm. if all of us were to blame for everything. Wouldn't that be terrible? And um, Because yeah. we'd be blamed for everything that's actually going on, on the planet right now. That would be terrible yeah, to be attributed be things that we're not really to blame for yeah but but god also attributes what our participation is in that hmm. right? yeah which is really just yeah. isn't it? which is just yes yeah. so so don't believe that you know you know god's <laughs> just just because you're in this state now that god's going to blame you for a whole of this state yeah. the only thing he can say to you though is you have control over the sin that now is in you yeah only i can release only only he can only you can erase it however he can help you erase the sin that was caused by others within you hmm. nice. so he can nice. provide a lot of assistance to transform you with the sins that others caused uh -huh. but the sins that you caused i have to take responsibility you're going to have for. to take responsibility for does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. Now, you'll learn that in redemption, that it's very important that we start assigning who's responsible. Yeah. And God assigns responsibility down to the most infinite yeah. particle. Yeah. So he knows exactly who's responsible for everything in you. The key for you is to take responsibility for things that you have created mm -hmm. and take responsibility for the fact that you're shutting down, removing them. See, yes. God, God can only help you release something that you are not resistive to releasing. Yeah. And this is what I find quite sad for many of you. We point out an emotional injury, you get all uppity about it and all judgmental about it, and in that moment, you're in resistance. Mm. Now, even if that emotional injury was created by your mum or your dad or something else that occurred in your childhood, God can't help you remove it now mm. because your resistance is going, don't touch me, don't <laughs> touch me. Don't yeah. don't deal with my stuff. Oh, don't don't expose my stuff, and and that resistance is causing you more trouble than actually the emotion itself. In a lot of ways, the emotion itself, God could just reach in and take out in many cases because they are it's caused by other people, but you're not letting him. Wow. So what can he do then? Nothing. Nothing. Your will, your desire, has control over your soul. He can't do anything. So this is what I see is happening for, the, for many of us, is that God's wanting to reach in, take out things from us, but we're just in so much resistance, we don't even let him do it. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. Which is sad, yeah. isn't it? And, and yet we haven't even created those things. Yeah. We're just so embarrassed and judgmental yeah. about the effects of them that we won't let anybody touch them. We guard them with our life, almost. Yeah, yeah which is sad. So, yeah. Yeah. And you want to ask the second part of it? Um, and I'm doing all of this without any intellectual knowledge of the details of the process. Yes. As it's only my soul perceptions that is capable of understanding this, not my mind or my brain. Yes, you could say, though, that uh, the majority of people, you know, I'm sure now that I've explained these things to you, many of you have now got some li a bit of intellectual concept, haven't you? Yeah. About the principles that guide you. So you can't say that it's all just uh, soul-based knowledge because there's some intellectual process going on where you start to see. But obviously, understanding the true impact of all of these principles that we've discussed with you is going to take many years to get the soul-based perception of them, isn't it? Yeah, and because just the actual details of them? That yeah, the, the, the details are intricate, as you yeah. can imagine, and affect, you know, like I said uh, to you, in the human body, there's three billion base pairs of, of mm. DNA that, con that control your DNA, three billion. How many laws do you think govern just that process? There's, there must be tens yeah. of thousands of laws, right, that govern that process, isn't that the case? Learning every one of those, it's going to be like obviously intricate detail. Does it make sense? But but obviously there's a there's the big way we can understand yeah. all this, which we'll go through tomorrow. Method yeah. number four, it is. We'll go through <laughs> tomorrow. Or there's the little bits and pieces that you discover through experimentation, and that will take you 
Well, you'll never finish never doing fun, that yeah. if you do it that way because obviously there's more laws being created than what you can actually <laughs> yeah, absorb. <exactly. laughs> so obviously a lot of the things we're learning through the, this, this uh, presentation with God, the understanding God's loving laws, are going to have an impact on your ability to understand and actually engage the principles so that you can rapidly clear away mm -hmm. what's going on in the soul. And that's why tomorrow, getting to that, that's why tomorrow is essential for, for you guys. Tomorrow is an essential thing because we're talking about the two things that get rid of the problems in your soul and transform your soul. The redemption principles and the transformation principles. So obviously you can see that the, with the course we've identified for you this week, we're building up to how, what do you do about this? You know, you can see these other principles that have demonstrated to you the sin, demonstrated to you how much sin, given that we're sinning against billions and billions and billions of laws all at once, and then a rapid way to address that. Fortunately, imagine if God said, no, you have to address it one at a time. <laughs> we, we, we'd learn the truth and then we'd feel more depressed <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and that's the way it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd feel terribly depressed. You? Well, you'd, you'd probably go off and just shoot yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you imagine that up. teaching on the planet. Everybody who <laughs> goes along to a divine truth session should end up shooting themselves. <laughs> Obviously, wouldn't be very good. So, so, <laughs> so, so you can see that you can see that God's given you ways to address these in a nice, sincere, desirous way, and to alleviate the unhappiness quite rapidly as a result yeah. of that. So that's, that's an expression so of God's love as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's an awesome gift. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our Q&A there. So thanks to you guys for engaging that with us. A bit of, uh, bit of heaviness in that little pre presentation, perhaps, coming to terms with our own responsibilities again. We don't like the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> But what we'd, uh, so we'd like to finish that presentation now. And what we'd like to do before you go, though, is Corny just wanted to say goodbye to you because he won't be here tomorrow. He's engaging some of his other desires tomorrow. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say goodbye, so I won't be here. Got to go and do a building course that I've been doing for, this goes over eight months, and this is unfortunately falls on the weekend when these <laughs> um, seminars are on, both of the end ones. So I'll just say goodbye now. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I just want to thank you guys too for your donations as well. And it was really lovely to meet a lot of you yesterday that I never met before and get to know you. Yeah. yeah. I'd really, really like to thank the team though. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Those guys are, thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Connie. Yeah. Go Stand for the pee now. <laughs> Yeah, trust, trust me, being a camera operator is not all the glory it's, uh, it's hyped up to be. It's, 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 it can be fun, but it, but it also means standing up with me the whole time, which obviously uh, you know, takes a bit out of you as well. So I'd like to thank our guys for doing that for us. Yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow, Corny gets replaced by Eloisa, who's, uh, who's going to do the other camera for us tomorrow. And uh, that means Eloisa has, has had to miss out on the last day of, of both, uh, both groups. And, uh, and so that means that she's going to be waiting for the, uh, <laughs> for the movie, the videos that come out, obviously. All right, well, I'd like to finish off there. Sorry about our late finish today. It's about 20 minutes late, guys, so sorry about that. But I'm sure, uh, hopefully, you've enjoyed. I'm not, I shouldn't say I'm sure, because <laughs> I can feel that some of you are not. I'm not that sure about. But uh, hopefully, at some point, uh, that's just a hope. I don't know if it's <laughs> going to ever be realised. <laughs> hopefully, you'll benefit from the material. And we'll get started tomorrow at 11 a.m., just like uh, normal. And, uh, and we may finish a bit later tomorrow, because we're, we're going to go through some things after afterwards about our plans as well so it might take a bit longer than what we've planned we've we've got and we'll do a photo at the end of the day tomorrow too probably so it might take a bit longer for us to do that but thanks for your time today guys and we'll see you tomorrow thanks.